We're on. All right. Um, welcome, everybody, to Data Science Office Hours this week. Um, tonight, it's just me and Fabio. Again, everyone else um, in the group has has other other engagements. They're all doing exciting things. Um, but we, uh, Fabio and I, have a have a topic that we're really excited to talk about. In fact, before this went live, we were <laughs> we were going back and forth about about this topic. Um, and you know, it's it, we're talking about auto ML. Um, and, and I, you know, I've been a data scientist long enough that I remember. You know when the term first came out and people were first talking about it, um, there was a lot of worry that you know this was going to replace what data scientists do, and a lot of worry that you know so much of what data scientists do that people were were saying that it could be autom uh, automated. Um, and now, as we're actually starting to get some pretty robust auto ML tools, um, you know I, I'm really excited. And if anything, I feel like these tools are making. Um, Making it possible to be a, a much better data scientist to to automate and and do a lot of things quicker um, than than you would in, in the past. And so, um, you know, tonight Favi and I are going to talk about you know our experience with AutoML, um, a, a lot of the the different um, you know things that we've encountered, things that you know we haven't tried out yet, but but we want to. Um, and I guess to start, I ask Favio how. You know, what's your experience been with AutoML, and, and how, are, how are you using it? All right. So hi, everyone. And we're happy to be here again. And the thing is, first, I haven't used it in production in any company. That's, that's the, the real truth. I mean, I've, I've used it for, my, for, for studying, for researching my own. But I haven't had the chance to be in a company that first had the libraries for, for doing auto ML or the tools um, or that accepted a pro a proposal for me to do an auto ML uh, like model so uh, my experience was I mean I've been using several of these packages mostly h2o and I'll also try teapot and I was an auto escalator and the thing I, I think is I'm really amazed of, of how these uh, projects has been evolving. And mostly H2O because I, I, I don't think they had in their plan originally to create an auto ML tool. And that that came afterward because, uh, I mean, in the beginning, it, it, it was like, a, I don't know, like a machine learning library. So, uh, Right now, there's been an explosion. It's not that big, but it's like an explosion of, of different tools for AutoML. And we have like uh, six or seven that are out there right now being used in some companies or research or papers. And I mean, in my experience, it's, in, in, in my experience it has been really easy to get from zero to AutoML in, in like uh, a simple tutorial. I mean, it was very, I mean, more, much more harder for me when I was starting to understand machine learning and doing all the courses and, and learning the math behind every algorithm and thinking about what, what's a random forest and what's these kind of things. I mean, right now, I think now I have that experience and I've been working hard trying to tune my models. Uh, it was very easy to just, you have one function, that's it. And it's, it's the, the AutoML function that will receive different things depending on the library, but mostly like the training data, uh, how much model they have to generate, and that's it. In the end, it will generate a lot of different models, and it will give you the best result they, that they have. So I think my experience was like that, and I think a lot of data scientists are, are, are having that experience because we actually come from manual machine learning. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think this is gonna be different for new data scientists because I think in the near future, this will be more and more important. And maybe in two years, it will be the standard for companies. So this is why people are worried about, so do I really need to understand everything uh, or just use one function as, 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 as an auto ML? I mean, for me, my suggestion will be first understand everything and then use auto ML, but I don't know how it's gonna go in the, in, in the this few years that's, that, that's gonna come. 
So I have, I, I think that's a really good point. Um, and it, it'll be interesting to see what happens. I, I found, so I just recently finished teaching a boot camp uh, of kind of new, new data scientists. And when we were, we were teaching them about um, machine learning, some of them that hadn't had a statistics or math or science background, it was, it was hard to wrap their head around what a machine learning algorithm was doing. And so it was really useful to first kind of show an auto ML solution, say, look, this is just what's going on. You know, this is what the outputs are like. This is how random forest works. Um, and so they can at least understand, okay, this is what's going on. This is kind of what I should expect for the output. Um, and then at that point, you can actually start digging in what the different parameters are and other things like that. Because I think sometimes if you're completely unfamiliar with the idea of algorithms, um, just going straight off and saying, okay, there's all these different parameters that you can tune and these are the rules of thumbs and, and everything like this, the syntax, that can be really overwhelming um, kind of a, as a first <laughs> first pass uh, into algorithms. Um, and so I think AutoML can kind of play a role there to help you just say, okay, this is generally how machine learning works. The danger is though, and I think this is something that, that um, data scientists have voiced ever since AutoML <laughs> started being talked about, is that um, you know when you just get to a point of where you're pushing a button and not understanding what's going on under the hood, um, that can be really dangerous. Um, it can be dangerous for um, you know drawing conclusions from your data that 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 shouldn't be. Um, it, it, it can end up with worse you know worse models in production. So I think um, just like any other tool that that we have, you, you know libraries that we use in Python or packages in R or, or whatever, um, you need to know what it's doing, um, even though you're using th these functions and these tools to help make your life easier. So, but um, coming to this point, I, I think this is very interesting, and I have some somehow a, a different perspective here, because if you think about it, there's a lot of people doing machine learning without doing what's machine learning. Mm -hmm. others. This is not one person, it's a lot of people. Mm -hmm. and I mean, if you compare, what what is better to people for uh, to to use an auto ML that will give you some what a good a, a good model? Maybe you don't understand anything, but I think it will be safer for this kind of people that are just going blind into 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 data science to use auto ML than to actually try to tune a model that they have no idea how it works. Yeah. So I I I mean I. I don't know if we're going to have that kind of worries in the future because a lot of things will be automated in the future. I mean, and right now, of course, this is it's, 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 it's scared. I mean, for, for the people who have been doing machine learning for five five years, something like that, I think we know the, the pain you have to, to and, and the time you have to spend trying to uh, tune your parameters, understand the data, and do all these different kind of things. But right now, with AutoML, like in H2O, for you, it's done automatically, the feature engineering, feature extraction, feature selection. So a lot of these uh, steps that maybe people are not doing correctly are done by you uh, with like good rules. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I, if you check the, the papers and stuff, I, and there's an, the, a step for optimizing the, the, the parameters they, they, they do and they use for starting the algorithm and in the end too. So I, I, I think it, it can be scary for people to just go, go out there and just click a button and just have a machine learning model. But if these people are the same people that are doing machine learning without having any idea what they're doing, I think it's better mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in that step. I mean, yeah. I think the, 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 the truth here is you need to understand the things you're doing. Even though they're only a button, I mean, there's buttons that that can do a lot of things in the real world. And you don't necessarily have to understand what's going on. I mean, I have no idea how my phone works, but I'm not scared because I, I'm, I mean, I, I think the people that created it, uh, they have the idea of, of how they created it and that it will work. And I will never know what happens when I click my 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 phone uh, touch ID. I mean, I have no idea, and, and I don't care that much. Because and and I, I I I think this is one of the things we have to compare to outer ML, that in the near future we'll have we'll, we'll, a lot of the steps we're gonna do as data uh, scientists will be automated, 
And I think this is a step I, I want, I, this is the thing I want to ask you right now. So there's a lot of uh, people talking that this will, uh, this will kill all, all the data science jobs out there. And this is just uh, not that good because it, for us as data scientists, because we're our work and stuff. So do you think that outer mail is uh, the same as outer data science? Or is the same thing as uh, hiring a data scientist? So I, um, I am not worried about being replaced by an algorithm <laughs> or, or software um, uh, to, to answer that. Because I, I think that you know, throughout the whole history of, of data science, and even before kind of stats and, and machine learning, um, and even software development, there's always been tools to make um, the job easier. You know, new libraries come out, new packages come out. Um, and, you know, anything that, that lets you focus less on, on the, the tedious coding and, and more on actually solving problems, um, I, I, th I think is a huge benefit. Um, and, and I feel like, for me, the, the biggest benefit that I bring as a, as a data scientist is, is bringing a scientific perspective um, to, to solving problems. Um, and that's not something that we, we figured out how to automate yet. Um, and, I, and I don't know that we will in, in any, any time in the, in the near future. Every company is different. Um, every data set that you encounter it, it, it is different. Um, you know, there, there's a surprising amount of creativity that's required in, in data science, um, thinking out of the box and, and looking at things a different way and trying to understand, you know, what, what the underlying truth is, you know, and, and machine learning is, is just, just a tool to accomplish that. Um, and, and I think, you know, AutoML makes a lot of, a lot of that easier. You still have to know, um, you still have to know when to use the right algorithm. You still have need to have an idea of how parameter optimization works. Um, and so I think um, all, all of the, the hardest parts of a data scientist's job are, are not, not going away, the ones that require us to use our brains. Yes. Yeah, and, and I think this is actually better for us as data scientists because we're spending a lot of time in things that value to the company. And I mean, if, of course, it's important to do these different transformations to the data and like building 10 or 15 different models for, for you to, to be sure of what, what you're doing. But this can take a long time. And, and, and tuning in algorithms by hand and model can take weeks or months. Mm -hmm. So I think it's uh, better for us as data scientists to have these kind of tools because we'll, we can focus on things that actually add value to the company, like our perspective on problems or how to present these problems and, and how they solve issues for the company or, or spend more time understanding the business because when you start a, a new problem in a company, you're, you're worried about a, a lot of different things. Like, I'm, I'm going to spend this time trying to understand the problem and going to meetings and knowing the people and the business and stuff. And I'm, I'm going to spend this much time uh, cleaning the data and this much time feature engineering the data and this much time uh, creating the models. So if we can just take like these different uh, weeks or months for uh, of work into we into days, I think that's a that's a very good thing to do because right now we're trying to build agile data science mm -hmm. where you can create a, a lot of uh, more things. More, I mean, in a faster way, and you can uh, give results to the company faster. I think mm -hmm. a lot of people is worried because, I mean, I've been in the position that people ask me, so how long is it going to take? Because I know that data science is not that easy, and you, and this is like an exploratory science and stuff. So, I'll, and for and for us, it's, it's, it's hard to know. I mean, how much time is it going to take for solving a problem? Because we're, we have no idea on, uh, on the new problems that will come in the near future. Well, and the, I reason, think, yeah. the reason they hire us is because they don't know the solution to the problem, right? Yeah, yeah <laughs> so, of course. No, so but, I, but I, I, I think that there's the, the companies are understanding 
that this is not a software engineering process that you can create a plan for this week and a plan for this week and right now even for experienced data scientists it's not easy to to know what's going to happen in the next project and if we can automate these kind of things that take us a long time to build i think it's just good for for us as data scientists i ab absolutely agree with that um and, and i love how um you know, it'll make us quicker on our feet. And, and especially one thing that, that I've started using AutoML for is um, hy hypothesis testing, you know, even just quickly try out on a data set before I've done a ton of tuning or feature just to, to see what kind of predictive powers in the data set and try a bunch of different algorithms. And, and data science is a very iterative process anyway. Um, and having these type of tools kind of early on in the process can really help you dictate where you should spend your time. Um, and, um, you know, I, I think to your point, Fabio, it, it makes things go a lot quicker. Um, you already mentioned a couple of the tools that you've been using and playing around with. Um, maybe we could talk about some of those in, in more detail and what, and what we like, ones that we've used and what we like, and, and maybe what, um, you know, maybe we don't like and, and other things like that. So, um, All right. So I think um, for, for myself, I can divide them in two groups. Uh, one is for machine learning and simple neural networks. And the second one can be for like deep learning. Mm -hmm. And in the first part for machine learning, um, what will norm what will you normally see if you go after watching this video into these libraries is that they will have mainly two functions. One for classification and one for regression. And that's normally what will happen there. Mm -hmm. And you will have an AutoML tool for classifying things and one AutoML thing, uh, uh, functions for, for regressions. So this kind of APIs uh, uh, are common in the, I think, three most used libraries out there. One is H2O, mm -hmm. second is Teapot, and the third one is AutoCycleLearn. So um, uh, as I said before, I've been using more H2O and there's more and more tutorials on, on AutoML on the internet for, for H2O, so I think it's great. And they have a very, uh, they have two great videos online on YouTube. You can search for them. They just, just type AutoML H2O and just watch them. They're, they're very simple and they have an introduction to AutoML and how does it work for do, to, to do AutoML on H2O. Uh, the teapot and the, uh, our SQL Learn are more like for, I mean, because H2O is a platform. I mean, people need to understand that H2O is open source, but they also they also have like a big platform mm -hmm. and with with, with uh, GUI and stuff, and it's mm -hmm. not it's, it's easier for for you to get there. And and but the Teapot and also in, in, in our SQL Learn, they come from researchers in in mm -hmm. uh, uh, schools and universities. And those are more focused on solving things that you will normally do by coding. The teapot is working with generic algorithms. And the uh, I think the auto SQL learn, I'm not sure how they built it, uh, but I think uh, they they are using Bayesian optimization mm -hmm. to, to improve the models. And there's a great paper uh, if, if you have time to read for the guys who created out to cycle learn they actually won uh, several uh, challenges i mean i think there was a challenge on Kaggle or or somewhere else i, I i'm not sure where was it uh, for auto like uh, for auto machine learning and they won like it was like 10 problems and they won like seven so that's that's mm -hmm. great and before creating auto cycle learn, they created auto weka or weka. I don't know how to pronounce. Yeah, weka, yeah. Weka, yeah. And I think that's a library for for Java. I I, mm -hmm. I, I don't know for for do machine learning. And they based uh, the auto cycle learn tool on the auto weka tool they created before. So there's like a path if you need to understand like the history of the tool. It's like first auto weka and then auto machine learning uh, for cycle learn. So. Um, I mean, I cannot say a lot about any of them, and I, th I, I think the only people can say a lot is the creators because 
<laughs> uh, I mean, this is not widely and extremely used, and you, and, and you don't have a ton uh, like videos and tutorials and books on subject like you have with pandas and, and cycle mm -hmm. learn alone or Spark and things. And uh, so, but, but to finish this, uh, the part for deep learning, uh, there's uh, I think two big competitors in the area, and one is Google AutoML, and that that's in a private beta. Uh, Alpha, sorry. So you have to apply for them to uh, to give you the demo, and it's a I, I I haven't seen it before, but I think it's very easy to 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 uh, to use. I think they're only launching right now the Vision API uh, for AutoML, that you can just upload your photos or videos, and the tool tell you what's in there or for, uh, for image classification stuff. And the other one you can actually use right now is the deep cognition auto ML. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the platform is free. I mean, you don't have to pay for anything. If, if you don't load the the version, you can use your own GPUs or your own CPUs for for doing that. And I think you have some free time on on their cloud service. Um, I mean, uh, it's, it's very easy and it's focused on on, on deep learning. Um, the thing that's different from the deep cognition auto ML than the other ones. Because you have H2O deep learning auto ML, that's not that complicated because when you have auto ML for deep cognition, you can actually uh, create uh, hard models like convolutional uh, networks and rest nets and RNNs and all these different uh, kind of tools and, and technologies we have in deep learning to create a model. And I think I, I spoke with one of the creators yesterday, he told me. Uh, it's a rule-based system, but they're, uh, the, in the next few months, they're going to try to add a lot more functionalities and intelligence behind their auto ML services. So that, that's my take on the point. So I think that, that's a great overview, Fabio. Thank you. And, and my recommendation that if you're new to machine learning, um, I would recommend first having a general idea of of different types of algorithms and when you might use them and generally how they work. You don't need to be an expert. Um, and then I'd recommend trying out H2O first um, just because it has has great in interface in Python and in R. Um, and there might be a couple other languages. But um, it's really easy to learn, um, easy to use, um, especially if you've, you've played around with um, tuning your own models a little bit in SK Learn or or in Carrot and R, um, you know that would be my my recommendation. Um, and, and some of these other tools. I think, it's, uh, yeah, go yeah, ahead. I mean, I think that that's the, that's a good point because uh, the best document, I mean, the best documentation out there for auto ML, I think, is in H two O. So mm -hmm. start there. Yeah, I've been I've been very impressed with um, with their platform and their program um, and and the accessibility from R and Python um, and and uh, yeah, so so that's my recommendation. Um, let's see, I had another question to ask you. Um, so maybe we could talk about uh, um, what. <laughs> Maybe and maybe we covered this already, but what exactly is auto about auto ML? <laughs> what is an auto ML? Oh, right. You know, yeah, I, 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 auto I think ML. Good point. Yeah. All right. So I can recommend uh, for you to, uh, after watching this, uh, first go to the videos uh, uh, for H two O. I think they have a conference called H two O World, and it was I. I don't know where was it, but I think it was on, on December last year. So it's the, they're very recent videos, and and they're out there on YouTube for free. And they also have the slides for, for free too, if you want to download them. And and also uh, go and read Matthew Maggio's post on Katie Nuggets on the uh, like the state of the art of or, or the actual state of of uh, out to ML right now. He, he has very good definitions in there. And he interviewed uh, people from H two O two, and and Teapot. So, sorry, I think he interviewed someone for, for from Teapot, and I, I'm not sure right now. So there's a very uh, good post for for just getting into the field. So when we say auto machine learning, 
we're talking about automatically creating models for machine learning and uh, and the steps before uh, creating a model. I mean, normally, in, in for example, in H2O, uh, the AutoML package uh, or, or function or API will, will uh, transform your variables, select the best variables, uh, do, do for you feature engineering, and all of these different kind of things we, we normally do in, in machine learning before doing anything. And I think they, they can also normalize and standardize your data. So that's, mm -hmm. I, I think it's, it's, it's very com uh, complete. So afterwards, what it will do is it will try to create, and it will create a lot of different models. I think you can say, yeah, just create 10 or, or 20 or, or 30. And what it will do is they, uh, it will, I mean, you have functions in machine learning to to see and, and and you have ways to see if a model if a model is, is doing well and what is going to do is it will run all of these different models on your data and in the end it will give you a champion model and it can and it will say to you so i created 10 models and the the model that won was this random forest and um, and because uh, they had it, it, it has this, this accuracy and it has this log loss. That's it. And there's another thing for for H two O that's very cool that you have a stack examples and ensembles. Sorry, and these ensembles are very uh, very uh, powerful because what they do is you created, for example, ten models, some random forests and some uh, gradient boosted machines and stuff. And these stack examples can combine those models and and I think that's very powerful because sometimes uh, you can uh, you, this model can perform can perform better in some kind of data and this model can perform better on some kind of data and if you can have the both worlds in one model that's better and that's what the stack example uh, API part is doing for you and they also random uh, randomly start your parameters and they tune your your happy parameters for you so all of the steps for doing machine learning, not, not data science, only machine learning, is when is what we call auto machine learning. Yeah. I the great great overview. I, I think that that's um, that was a, an awesome overview. And um, you know, another way to think about it is um, when you have a function, you have <laughs> parameters. <laughs> when you enter in that that function, auto mal. Um, kind of helps you figure out the optimal parameters for those automatically. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, I think, I, I think um, that's great. It, it's, I mean, it's really important to know, um, you know what is happening uh, with your data um, you know, before putting it into to an auto ML algorithm. But um, so one, and I loved how you mentioned H2O's um, ensembling capability. And I think we've talked about ensemble models before in this, but but just a reminder um, for those that may be unfamiliar with the term ensemble, uh, it, it's when you 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 chain algorithms at you know after one another, or or you or, or you know you you use multiple algorithms combined to to achieve a better result. So some algorithms may do better on a, a subset of the data, predicting the data than others. Um, and you may not be able to find one algorithm that does well on your entire data set, but you could find multiple algorithms that together do really well on your entire data set. So yeah, and I'm I'm reading some some comments here in in the chat, and and one of the things people say are, are saying is I, I say this tech companies don't worry about interpretability, and and this is I think a, I I don't know what what is I mean what he meant with this, but it, it came to my mind that one of the problems people can say, yeah, so how can you interpret a model that is a stack example of three different models and stuff? So this is a good question because in a lot of companies, and we talked about this in the last session, you need to be able to explain the models to, to the business. And you need to ask before if it's really important for the business to understand the model. Because there's not 
I mean, that's not that important for every solution in the business, but for some of them, that is very important to, to understand the model. So, I mean, don't worry about that. And if you're thinking how to do that, there's two blog posts uh, by Matt Dancho and where he uses H2O deep learning and in mm -hmm. the end he used Lime. Mm -hmm. And Lime is a tool for understanding uh, or explaining the model for you and, and, and other people. And, and I mean, don't worry about uh, uh, that because the people that are actually creating these different kind of models and stuff and in, in, in libraries are, are also worried on, uh, mm -hmm. about that. So you have tools, and I think we'll, we're going to have more and more tools because I can only think of Lime right now, mm -hmm. but I think in the near future we'll, we'll have more tools that will make you able to understand the model. So um, I think he has a, a solution for churn uh, using, I think it was attrition or churn using H2O mm -hmm. and, and deep learning, and in the end he used uh, uh, the Lime package to understand uh, yeah, so what's the importance of the variables and are they correlated and what will happen if a person is ha have this kind of has this age or this different kind of age and, and, and this kind of thing. So uh, I, I think the part for if you're not a researcher, I mean, you don't have to worry about interpreting these things. If you are, please continue doing your work because we need <laughs> <it>. <laughs> yeah, We always can use better tools, but there are a lot of really great tools out there. Um, yeah, I think that's a good point. And, and I highly recommend Matt Dancho's blog posts. They're always exceptional. He's, he's primarily an R guy, um, but he, he's just, um, yeah, but I, really, I really love his blog posts. Um, There's a question here. I think it can be related. Is, can you please suggest how to deploy a model in production? I mean, if we can think on... Okay, so I created my stack ensemble model, or my random forest was the, the winner for the AutoML uh, tool. Uh, how can I put that in production? I think we talked about uh, that before, not that much, and we will be talk talking about that with Andreas, mm -hmm. because he's the one who, who can give a, a really good answer here, because he's a machine learning engineer and a big data engineer, so he, he can ask better these things than me. But um, in the end, you need to think what is production for you. Because if production only means being able to predict new things, uh, there's a lot of ways of, of, of doing that. If production for you means having the model into a mobile brand where people can call, uh, you use a call back for the server and, and, and just run a model and give you a prediction that's very different. Mm -hmm. So right now, this these tools. Um, I mean, I, I can give an example for deep cognition. And if you create a deep cognition model with a two, with, with AutoML, uh, you can actually in the end deploy it into a REST API. Mm -hmm. So without doing anything or or coding, I mean, you can just I mean, you can have your image classifier, and you have a a, a REST API, and you can create calls from Python or R or JavaScript. Mm -hmm. And you can, and they will actually create a web, like a, a, a web application for you, where you can just drag and drop your images and stuff, and it, it will predict things for you. So I think we have different kind of tools uh, for for uh, building models in the production. And I, I think we're gonna uh, take on that when Andreas is here. Yeah, I think that's a that's a topic I'm I'm excited to talk about in more detail as well. Um, and I think you and just to, to to follow up on what you said real quick. I, the first question that you asked is is the right question: is what does production mean for your company? Um, you know, how is this going to be used, and what does it mean by production? And and you need to like one very important thing is you need to know talk with the front end developers and know what. <laughs> Now, what are they expecting to receive from data science, and how are they expecting to receive it? Um, so, if if they're working primarily up in at, you know in JavaScript, then they probably want your results delivered in in via a REST API. You know that would be really easy. If if production for your company means an internal tool that everyone's going to be using, or for some companies it means like a macro in Excel. <laughs> you know, and there's ways to get Python and and R to work with Excel, or or 
or Tableau. Um, one tool that I, I really like um, for Python is Flask, um, which, which lets you, it handles the HTTP protocol, and lets you set up a, a REST API where you can, you can pass in arguments from, from a front end to a Flask Python script, and it'll run the, the, the Python uh, script on the back end and then sp spit back out. Um, you know, and we can talk about more that in more detail. Um, there's there's a whole bunch to talk about. There's you know we can talk about Docker. We can talk about all all, all different types yeah, of things. Or, or or tools for R like R Studio Connect. Yeah. I don't know if you know about R Studio Connect. This is a very interesting tool. You can just deploy your models into a dashboard or a report PDF, a parameterized PDF. And it's, it's very interesting to do that. And I think yeah, we, we can talk about that later. Wait, that deserves its whole a whole own episode. Yeah, I, so I but, think um, uh, we have a last question here, and this is interesting. I don't know if it's related, but it's interesting. Is is a data scientist responsible for deployment of a production in production for a production model into the production? No, I I, don't, I didn't read that correctly. Sorry. Is data scientist responsible for deployment of a model in production? And the answer is no. <laughs> well, I would say it depends. Hopefully, hopefully <laughs> not, but it, it will always be yes. Uh, yeah, so at, at my company um, right now, it would be yes, because no one else in the company has any idea how to do that. And I might be working with some software developers, but um, I, you know, I have enough of full stack experience that, that I, I can do that. Um, if you're in a lot larger company, then, then no, you'd be in a team where you wouldn't be responsible for that. So it, it's absolutely dependent on, on where you're at um, for smaller companies. Yes, you know you, you yeah, need to know I, front end. I, and... I think yeah, of course that's that's true. But I think this is a uh, part of the job of the data engineer. But as I mentioned before, and I think we all do this. Uh, uh, I think we all the time in companies, even they're big or small, we we act as data analysts mm -hmm. uh, or business intelligence people, and we do data science and we do data engineering because normally. And this is something that's happening because this is the beginning of the field, of like the serious field. Maybe in the future, the, we, we, we will not have this problem. But we, right now, as, as you said, sometimes you're the only guy who knows these things. Or sometimes there's like two guys. And mm -hmm. and all of the other people, I mean, they're just learning for you, mm -hmm. from, from you. So it's, it's not easy for, to get. And it's not cheap to get. Uh, yeah, I need four data engineers and five, five data scientists. I mean, that's not cheap for <laughs> companies to to have all the stack of people to, to deploy a model into production. But that is a part of the data in, in engineering world. But normally, you are doing everything in the company. So that, that, that's, I mean, don't get frustrated. Because I, I think a lot of people can get frustrated. And I've, I've met people that are telling me, yeah, right now, I'm only building like uh, dashboards and stuff. And that's not what the a data scientist should be doing. And that's true, but sometimes you need to adapt to, to, to some things. And of course, if you will be doing all uh, that for the rest of, of your life, and you need to change jobs. But uh, maybe the part of, of, of your job can be created a, a, a dashboard. I mean, it's not, it's more for like a data analyst uh, like a person, but it's something you need to be able to do too. Well, and I, I, I feel like it, it's, essential for a data scientist at least at some point in their their training to have experience with every part of the data science pipeline whether or not they end up doing that but seeing something go all the way from data collection data engineering all the way up to to putting it into into production and actually doing some of that is an incredibly valuable experience because all the time that I've spent doing dashboards it's not my favorite thing by any means um, makes me a better at machine learning. <laughs> you know, it, it um, doesn't sound like it would, but it, it helps me understand how things are going to actually be used, um, and 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 they all relate with each other. So, um, all right. Okay. Uh, so I think uh, finally, this is a question here: Is AutoML suitable for companies that have only a team of AI engineers instead of data scientists? What you say? I would say uh, the problem with this this industry right now is there's so many different titles and it's 
almost impossible to know exactly what those titles mean. Um, and yeah, at one it, company, it, the AI term, engineer? that could I mean, be a data scientist. That could be what in one company is a data scientist. That could be a machine learning engineer. That could be an analyst. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's hard, hard to say. I think AutoML is suitable for any anyone who's using machine learning as, as part of, of, of what they do, it, it's worth looking into. Um, and I wouldn't, I, you know, whether you're an AI engineer or a data scientist, it, it's, it's simply just a tool to help you do machine learning yeah. faster. I, I think that's true. And if, I mean, if for some reason you're hearing this and you're wondering what's a, AI engineer, there's a good blog post on towards data science, just write AI engineer I, I don't remember who, who wrote it, but he gives a really good definition on what's AI engineering as a, as, a, as a separate field. I mean, for me, before reading that post, was like a data engineer with some data science uh, tools in, the, in, in his mind. But I, I, I think uh, you can have a good, uh, I, I think I understand the question for, for this guy. If, if he's talking about what I think he's talking about, I think it's, it's a good question because sometimes these AI engineers are the ones who are make it, putting things into production with the data engineer people. Uh, so sometimes they're not uh, aware of of all of the stack that that a, a, a data scientist knows, and they not they they're not experts on like the future transformation and stuff. So. I think it can be better for them to, to, to have this kind of tools. And I think, as you said, it's better for all of us to have these yeah. tools. And yeah. they will be more important in the near future. All right. all right. Great answer. Well, I think we're going we're gonna to wrap up a little bit early because um, yeah. it's just both of us. And yes. you're, you're probably sick of hearing me talk, at least. I don't, probably not sick of hearing Fabio. But <laughs> um, all right, everyone, have a great night. We yeah. will see you later, a couple weeks. See you later, guys. Bye-bye. Have fun. Bye.